G'day and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Institute, and today we're bringing you more guests from our Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. This blue planet that we all share is still very much in the grip of a global pandemic, and Guardian Australia reports that worldwide there are 22 million cumulative cases of COVID-19 and more than 776,000 deaths. Our own state of Victoria is in the midst of a second wave of infections and we have 23,773 cumulative cases and 450 deaths in total across Australia with 52 people in intensive care the top units. Today, in contrast, the United States has 5.5 million cumulative cases and more than 171,000 deaths. More cases 675 than any other Victorians in hospital, world. 45 of those are receiving intensive care and 29 of those 44 are on a ventilator. Today, 690 people have died from coronavirus in Victoria and 52 in the past of those hospitalised people with COVID-19 so are in intensive 675 Victorians in hospital, in Australia, 45 of those are receiving intensive, intensive care, care and 29 of those 44 are on a ventilator. Intensive care it is certainly an extra stress and strain for the intensive care unit uh, staff. I think there's simply more people infected with COVID-19 and uh, as a result of that, there are more people coming into intensive care. Perhaps the hardest Inside part of treating COVID-19 people here dedicated is the complete isolation of patients from their family and friends. One of the things we're seeing is staff. really high I numbers think of positive cases in healthcare workers. Yeah, and just under a thousand, as a result of that, there are more people coming into intensive care. Perhaps the hardest part of treating people here is the complete isolation of patients from their family and friends. My name's Dan, and I'm a pediatric pediatric registered nurse. One of the things we're seeing is really high numbers of positive cases in healthcare workers. Yeah, just under a thousand, as a result of that, there are more people coming into intensive care. Perhaps the hardest part of treating people here is the complete isolation of patients from their family and friends. My name's Dan, and I'm a registered nurse. One of the things we're seeing is really high numbers of positive cases in healthcare workers. Yeah, just been diagnosed with COVID-19 and I'm in total isolation. We are nowhere close to the levels of immunity required to stop this disease transmission. And we need to focus on what we can actually do now to suppress transmission. Throughout the Melbourne pandemic, and I've just been diagnosed with COVID-19 and I'm in total isolation. We are nowhere close to the levels of immunity required to stop this disease transmission. And we need to focus on what we can actually do now to suppress transmission and not live in hope of herd immunity being our salvation. Right now, that is not a solution. And one of the main goals of public health around the world has been to prevent the number of severe cases from overwhelming hospitals and the health system. We know that severe cases of COVID require intensive care, sometimes respirators, and early on we saw hospitals in Italy and other countries overwhelmed by the sheer volume of cases. But we're also starting to hear concerning stories about the prolonged recovery and other impacts on COVID-19 survivors. And of course, we still have no vaccine and only minimal treatments for this disease, meaning that clinicians are learning on the job how best to treat it. So that's why we were privileged by our guests, three experienced ICU clinicians who are part of the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium study, the first study of its kind in the world. Led by researchers from Queensland, the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium study is a worldwide clinical study using artificial intelligence to examine COVID-19 patient data from 300, that's right, 300 intensive care units across the world to provide insight for health professionals to determine the best treatments for the disease. Professor John Fraser is the director of the Critical Care Research Group at the Prince Charles Hospital and University of Queensland in Brisbane and director of the intensive Intensive care unit at St Andrews War Memorial Hospital. John's extensive global network helped facilitate the birth of the Critical Care Consortium, the global alliance of more than 400 hospitals in 52 countries, dedicated to sharing clinical data to identify more effective treatments for the most critically ill patients. Professor Carol Hodgson is Deputy Director at the Australian and New Zealand Intensive Care Research Centre in DEPM and a specialist ICU physiotherapist at Alfred Health Melbourne. She leads international research in mechanical ventilation and rehab in ICU and she's currently leading a study into the recovery of critically ill patients after COVID-19 across 30 hospitals in Australia. That's in partnership with the consortium. 
And Dr. Dan M. Meyer is a cardiothoracic surgeon in Dallas, Texas, in the United States. And he's affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area and has been in practice for more than 20 years. And with Texas now the forefront of America's COVID crisis, with more than half a million confirmed cases and almost 9,000 deaths, Dan offers a rare insight into how the United States has responded to the disease. He brings more than 25 years of experience as a cardiothoracic surgeon and a wealth of knowledge and skill to each patient case. With Texas now at the forefront of America's COVID crisis and with more than half a million confirmed cases and almost 9,000 deaths, Dan offers a rare insight into how the United States has responded to the disease. This was recorded live on Thursday, the 19th of August, 2020, and things may have changed since recording. We're delighted that you could all join us today. Thank you so much for coming along, Dan, Carol, and John. Um, Professor John Fraser, if I can start with you, can you take us through uh, this study and why it was important and really how it got started? Sure. Again, acknowledging the traditional owners, both in Burrowang, where Carol is, Wichita, and and Turable, where we are in Brisbane. Um, so we ended up here by mistake, to be 100% honest. Probably not the best way to start uh, my confessional. Uh, I, I'm the chair of the Asia-Pacific Region and Artificial Heart-Lung uh, Technology ECMO. And we had decided in November, way before we'd heard of Wuhan, that we would be interested to see why people with a flu, some people need two paracetamol and a lie down, and some people end up in intensive care. So we had created a, a, a group of about 10 or 15 clinicians across Asia-Pac to look at the next small flu virus that took off across the Asia Pacific region. And on January the 10th, we've got a large group here in Brisbane, as you mentioned, and one of our colleagues from Wuhan said, look, something's kicking off in Wuhan. Uh, so, we, so we started creating our study protocol uh, and very, very rapidly, Ebony, the phone started going from our colleagues around this area saying, hi, do you know about this disease? It, it's different. Patients are not acting the same way that they normally do with flu. Again, by this point, the virus hadn't been named. It hadn't been typed. We didn't know anything. Uh, so we, medics don't like not knowing things. Uh, <laughs> and the feeling of intellectual impotence was uh, overwhelming. You know, people that you've known and liked and got on with and collaborated with for years were struggling with people, the units starting to fill up. So we started to create a protocol to gather as much information about all aspects of the intensive care, assuming that this would basically just kick across Asia Pacific and then die down a la SARS. Uh, unfortunately, we were entirely wrong. Uh, but what we were fortunate to do was be able to start creating a network of people, many of whom knew each other, but many of whom didn't, and start to almost act as a cathartic process for those clinicians to say, I don't know what I'm doing, the phone. And it became apparent to me at that stage as the number started to burgeon and again we've got a lot of people from Italy in our group and then it bounced across to Milan that you know what was happening we were we were chatting in whatsapp groups and saying you know how would you ventilate this patient how would you dialyze this patient and that's kind of expert-based medicine rather than evidence-based medicine and I thought look at the moment this is fine to talk amongst each other but all these data points are there and if I've, you know, if we can link five people together, that's a bit useful. But what if we gather the five pieces or the 500 or the 5,000 pieces and analogizing human data to jigsaw puzzle pieces? When you've got four or five pieces or 5,000 pieces and they're spread across the world and they're not talking to each other, it doesn't work. If, if you bring them together, you start seeing a clear picture of that complete jigsaw puzzle. So we thought let's go broader to Milan initially and then as it extended and extended extended we said we can create a consortium not our consortium your consortium where we bring all the data together and we try and create this human jigsaw puzzle put it together and work out whilst we wait for the vaccine whilst we wait for the treatment we can work out something that will help clinicians whether that's in Texas or Melbourne or, or wherever how to best ventilate that patient because we're the ones faced with the sickest of the sick. Uh, they end up on a ventilator and, it, and without an instruction book, you know, when we go through medical school, we have a book with randomized controlled studies. We've got a process and a best uh, evidence pathway. What was happening here was the world was being washed uh, by a tsunami of patients where we had no instruction manual. And if you imagine it, it's really been, uh, you know, driving a breakneck speed 
down a motorway blindfolded with your mum and dad in the back of the car. So mm. we wanted to do better. And we decided to bring this data together in a safe, secure manner and spoke to a number of the University of Queensland, QUT, Adrian Barnett is the president of the Australian Society of Stats, IBM and Amazon and say, let's create something we can give to the rest of the world for nothing. Let's create, a, and being Scottish, that's important to me. Let's create a dashboard where we can take this data and assemble it in a clever way with people like Adrian and Sally Shrapnel at UQ, work in a clever way so that we can create, um, so that patient uh, doctors and nurses and physios in every hospital across the world can have access to up to the minute data on the biggest data collection we can get. And we can then create scenarios where I turn up at three in the morning and I'm looking at you know, 52 year old diabetic in bed three and I'm not sure what to do. Well, we can then put a scenario into this dashboard that we create to give a bit of understanding to the clinician that 83% of these 53 year old diabetics with respiratory failure will do this. And it's not as good as a randomized controlled study, uh, but as things are moving so rapidly, we need to have this data. So that was the rationale. It was really just, we were in the, the right place at the wrong time. There was nothing out there to help our clinician colleagues. And we thought, particularly Australia at that time, was not uh, badly affected. Melbourne has been now, but was not badly affected. And we thought we had a responsibility that Australia could do its bit for the global community that was suffering. And we could basically try and uh, coordinate this effort and work with artificial intelligence, clever stats, and give help to people at the bedside. So since then, it's, uh, you know, the, the, you know, medics can be a bit precious about their data. Obviously, there's there's data concerns and we take them into consideration. But I think the rationale and the reason why so many people came to us was there was nothing else there. And they saw this as a really simple, practical way to get as much information, whether you're in the richest hospital in Texas or the poorest hospital in Zimbabwe, people deserve the same information. You know, the lower middle income countries might not have the same fancy ICU machines, but we can at least enable them to have the data there at their fingertips. Thank you so much, John. That's uh, a really fascinating insight into how all that uh, kind of uh, kick-started and it sounds like an incredible resource for clinicians. Um, Professor Carol Hodgson, I might come to you next. Most of us hopefully will never experience going to or having a loved one in intensive care but can you take us through uh, what it's like for clinicians? And I'm even thinking here of, you know, what's the experience of having to don and doff PPE and how crucial that is and how much that changes the way clinicians can even uh, provide care? Thanks, Ebony. It's a great question. So I've worked in intensive care at the Alfred Hospital for over 20 years now, um, and this is by far my most challenging year. Um, I think everything has changed in terms of our normal processes. So because we have such huge concerns over the contagious uh, disease process of COVID-19, um, the, the donning and doffing of PPE is really time consuming, but it's also just the flow of patients through the unit. So um, I'll give you an example. I arrive uh, at the Alfred on a clinical day in the car park in my casual clothes. I have to walk to my department and get changed into my own scrubs. I then enter the intensive care unit and if I'm treating a patient in the COVID pod, I will need to put on hospital scrubs and then go in and treat the patient. So donning PPE um, at several points as we enter the intensive care, well, we have to wear face masks in the hospital all the time now and everywhere in Melbourne. Um, and then we have to, to go into the COVID pod. We'll don the N95 masks, full gowns, um, several sets of gloves, um, headwear, head mask, um, hair covers if you um, choose to wear hair, hair covers as well. Um, so all of that is quite a, a lengthy process. Just the getting changed into scrubs and donning the PPE takes, you know, an extra 15 or 20 minutes compared to a normal day. Once you're in the COVID pod, you have to don and off PPE for each COVID positive patient at the moment. So we um, have individual beds and, and negative pressure rooms. So you, you enter and exit very carefully. I think one of the best things that the hospital has done is trained people as what we call spotters. 
and the spotters sit outside of the room and they help you don and doff the PPE correctly and they watch you while you're in the COVID positive room to make sure that your PPE is in place. It's trying to keep us safe in the workplace and it's been really effective. Um, the, we've had very, very few um, positive COVID staff members from intensive care in Melbourne at all. Um, by far, you know, the, the staff that have become COVID positive have tended to be more ward staff or emergency departments, slightly less emergency department, but very few intensive care staff. And I think that's because we learnt very quickly from the international experience. We followed um, Singapore very closely when they had very low numbers initially and we, we uh, took upon us all their protocols in terms of donning and doffing PPE. But it's very time consuming, it's quite tiring. The process of just the, the movement, the flow in and out of the intensive care unit, there are different entrances and exits. You can't walk through doorways where you would normally have walked for the last 20 years. They're blocked off and, you know, they're not accessible. So um, the process of... Um, Anything that you might do with the patient might be different. So the number of um, times that you have to change gloves or the way that you have to disinfect in between, um, anything that's considered an aerosol generating procedure. So there's lots of things that we do as staff which we think are sort of learnt behaviours and we've had to unlearn them and, and just really think back to core principles about um, being very careful about um, not risking staff members um, in terms of contamination and infection. So I think that the thing that I would say is that, it, you know, it, we are really well supported. Um, I think we've had the most amazing leadership uh, in, in, in the intensive care unit. And that's not just our intensive care unit. The intensive care units across Melbourne have really come together as a, as a great unit. They're, everybody is providing support. We actually have processes in place um, at a Department of Health um, sort of level where if one unit is getting overwhelmed with COVID patients, they'll be transferred to another intensive care unit so that no one unit should feel overwhelmed at any one point in time. Um, and it also means that we have because we were quite slow in terms of the pandemic and we did well in terms of our first wave, it wasn't much of a wave, we had time to learn. So I think that we really had the luxury of time to learn how to don and doff PPE carefully, um, the structures and the systems that would be put in place, how the flow of equipment and staff needed to occur through the intensive care unit, um, communication a couple of times a week from a leadership level in the intensive care to talk through the difference um, in new protocols and, and you can imagine we're on about version 50 of the protocol changes around PPE so it's you know really really amazing to see how quickly that information is disseminated and uptake, uptaken by the staff um, and I think that it's been great to learn some new processes so for example we've instituted things like prone turning teams so for the very very sick patients who need to spend time on their stomach to improve their gas exchange we need about nine staff but we've been able to put together a prone team where those nine staff will enter the bed area together um, and we have a very, we, we'll practice it. We do it in simulation before anybody's allowed in a COVID bed space um, so that it's very well organised. There's somebody who coordinates it and leads it and stands at the end of the bed and there's two people who protect the airway and the head of the patient and there's three people on either side of the bed to do the actual turning. And all of this is rehearsed in a simulation before we would go and do it on a patient um, and we try and mix up experience. People who've done it several times with inexperienced staff it's worked really well and, and just um, to be a part of that process where we've all pulled together. So I think um, the great thing for us is that we've learnt from the international experience in Australia. We haven't had our health system overwhelmed. Our mortality rates are amongst the, the lowest in the world, which is absolutely a fantastic outcome. And I guess the question that we have now is just what are the long-term outcomes of our survivors? Because we are going to have a lot of survivors, particularly in this critically ill cohort. Um, and that's my particular area of interest in terms of my research. Um, we've done lots of work looking at the long-term outcomes of patients who are not COVID positive, And now we're going to be able to compare the functional outcomes of patients who are COVID positive with those who are non-COVID. Thanks, Carol. Um, we will probably come back to that, I think, but that's a really good, I think, just that behind the scenes insight into, into what it's like for the people who are there uh, on the front lines, so to speak. Um, apologies, I'm just having a bit of trouble with my internet connection, which hasn't happened to me before. Uh, bloody NBN, it's uh, <laughs> not very reliable in Australia. Um, 
uh, Dr. Dan Meyer, we'll come to you next. You are in a hotspot within a hotspot in Texas, in the United States. So firstly, can I ask, how are you doing uh, personally? And secondly, what can we learn from Texas and how you're experiencing things? Well, thank you, uh, Ebony, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this important panel. And I think like all of uh, us caring for these patients and everyone in the world, I think we're all tired of uh, COVID and we're tired of wearing our masks. And But what I've heard said, which is true, the virus is not tired and it's not stopping. So we have to just you know keep pushing and and do what we know works, which is wearing our mask and you know washing our hands and social distancing until the time that we do get a, a vaccine. So, yeah, it's uh, I think as Carol was talking that in the ICUs, it, it's everything has changed so much and it's ordeal, and it's it's really hard on the staff because it's all those steps that Carol talked about to get ready to see a patient with COVID. Um, is really exhausting uh, for the team and the patients are so sick. So it, it takes a, I think, toll on the healthcare team. So, but you know, what we're seeing in, in Texas, well, what we're seeing in the US, we were hit uh, in early March, uh, first in New York and that, um, that city being so densely populated really was hit hard with a lot of death. And it was uh, quite shocking for the whole country to see that because we hadn't seen, we had almost no patients and, and the thought was, well, we're gonna get the wave down here and no one could believe it. We'd look at each other and say, how can that be? I mean, we don't have one, we have like one COVID patient in the hospital. How can we be in three months like New York? But uh, New York, uh, luckily they, um, the governor there put in really strong uh, um, healthcare restrictions, uh, public health restrictions and control the virus so they could open up their society again slowly and open up their economy again. But um, down in Texas, we finally uh, started to see uh, COVID. And now uh, between Texas, California, and Florida, those are the big states in the U.S. that are heavily populated with uh, COVID. Um, and um, I, I live in Texas. I'm from California, so I can kind of give you an idea of what the difference is and how the different states are responding. So uh, we've seen a big rise. I think uh, now we're at 590,000 cases. And uh, in the US, as you said, there's uh, um, uh, 700 and some, almost 774,000 cases. Um, and the, the thought initially was just because now we're testing so much that maybe that's why there's so many cases. But when you look at the number of tests that are done versus the number of new cases, the number of the slope of the line of the number of new cases is actually much higher. So there is some truth that the more testing, the more patients you're going to find. But in the U.S., at least, the numbers are still going up, the number of hospitalizations. But the number of deaths, I think uh, what we're seeing, at least the number of deaths, and this is a good news, uh, the number of deaths in the ICU are decreasing slightly. And thanks to the efforts of uh, you know, uh, Carol and John and their colleagues and we're getting better at taking care of these really sick patients. Um, so the number of deaths going down, although the uh, number of new cases may have started to slowly level off, but it's still uh, still significant. And so what we see in the in the three states in Texas, um, the problem in the U.S. in general is that um, unlike some uh, countries that we that are part of the consortium, we've learned uh, from both. Italy early on from their investigators talking to the consortium. And then we've learned from um, recently from Vietnam where they have initially had very few cases and that's due to the fact that they had really strong governmental um, regulation on wearing masks, social distancing, um, sheltering in place. And so they had incredible um, control and then uh, a few weeks later, in one of our biweekly consortium meetings, uh, one of the investigators, clinicians from Israel came and he spoke about how they initially did have good results and then they did not and what the mistakes they made. And so in the consortium, we're able to learn from the, the good and bad throughout the world from uh, 
how to manage the patients. And so what we see in the U.S. is that the, the bad part in the U.S. is that um, we do not have a national mask mandate, and that's taking an effect on the spread of disease. So in, in Texas, I think Texas is probably the worst state because Texans, they don't like, um, they would rather uh, secede from the union and start their own country than uh, be told what to do or wear a mask. So <laughs> although there is a mask mandate in Texas, the, the enforcement is very variable. And so we've seen, you know, um, parts of the state that have gotten hit very hard. And then Dallas, uh, we've had some uh, good luck in the control. But then you have um, California, which um, uh, is a totally different uh, group of <laughs> people. And uh, the governor there actually put a mandate in early on for masks. But these crazy Californians, they don't like to be told what to do either. And they, they have this free spirit and, uh, and they have not uh, uh, been um, complying well with the governor's mandates. And uh, my theory is that they uh, they think that it's some the virus is some government uh, plot to control them, and so I think that's why many Californians are not uh, complying with the uh, governor's uh, mandate. But they they've paid the price because they have the most COVID cases in the U.S. It's six hundred thousand. Yeah, wow. And then there's Florida, which is our um, is another kind of crazy state in the U.S. And there are actually uh, some officials in Florida that are not sure that masks are needed. And so, and Florida is one of the few larger states that does not have a mask mandate. And so they've seen, you know, a, a quite a large uh, impact from the COVID um, virus. So it's, it's uh, you know, we've learned a lot uh, from, from the consortium about, um, you know, the impact of, you know, public health um, on, the, uh, on the control of the virus and, Right now, I think we have to, uh, until we get a vaccine, follow these uh, um, these lessons that we've learned from other uh, countries on how to manage the virus. Thank you, Dan. Um, I have been to Texas myself and have observed that same spirit of not not being told what to do. But I will say uh, Texas barbecue is some of the, the best food I've ever eaten in in my life and I'd encourage anyone when uh, international travel opens back up again, uh, make your way to Texas for some barbecue. It'll change your life. Um, But that's really quite distressing to hear, obviously the sheer number of cases, but also encouraging to hear, um, you know, how much can be learned from this uh, consortium and and the the global study that's being undertaken. Um, John Fraser, if I can come back to you um, before I get into a detail, a more detailed question about what we're learning, I did just want to um, come back to the Australian context for a minute, and uh, particularly since the Victorian second wave and the much harsher restrictions being imposed there, we have seen a number of conservative commentators. Um, like Andrew Bolt, um, Alan Jones, uh, the economics correspondent um, at The Australian, Adam Creighton, with a lot of people opposing lockdowns and kind of more or less insinuating this is just a disease that kills old people and it's not really worth the economic uh, pain that it inflicts uh, on Australia. What's your response to, to those kinds of comments and those armchair epidemiologists? Uh, my my commentary would be that they should come in intensive intensive care, come and see someone die without a relative, come and see someone like Carol or Dan not go to bed for thirty six hours, get out their armchair, uh, and commentate on things they know about. I, I'm you know it's it's physician or politician, or or just speaker. You know, it, it's it it's bamboozled me, not just Donald Trump, you know, we're, we're listening to people like Trump or Bolt tell us what medicine is going to work. You know, if you get a gas leak in your house, you go and get the gas board to fix it. If your bath springs a leak, you go and get a plumber. Where does someone like Andrew Bolt or or, or a retired school teacher, um, the, the, the rugby chap, where, where do they feel that they have the right to tell clinicians and patients? And the fact that it's just old people, um, with due respect to Mr. Uh, Allen, whatever his name is, uh, we're, we're all going to die someday. 
the fact that it's your grandmother or grandfather, they shouldn't have their life taken away if we can do better. And it's firstly, it's not just old people, but even if it was just old people, they still have a value to society. The society we live in has been created to by those old people, so shame on them. Um, every life is worth a value. And people that know about rugby coaching or school teaching or have done a basic arts degree should commentate on what they know. I wouldn't commentate on coaching a rugby team. They, they have a responsibility and they have a moral responsibility to not cause harm. As Dan says, you know, masks work. We know this has happened. As Carol is living in Melbourne, we know that what um, they've done there is dropping the numbers. There is a responsibility. It's easy, easy to commentate when you're not in the heat of battle. So I'd say to them, come on to the heat of battle. Come and listen to people like Dan or Carol or our colleagues in Vietnam or Brazil who've cried in these calls, who've lost family members and gone to work the next day, who've gone home with the risk of infecting their children. Come and walk in our shoes rather than commentate from the sidelines from your, your North, uh, North uh, New South Wales farm, uh, where it's very easy to see isolation is not necessary because you're surrounded by 500 acres. Mm. Uh, yeah, I can't help but uh, agree with that 100%, despite being a, a layperson. Um, we at the Australia Institute have, have talked a lot about uh, the economics behind those kinds of calls, which also don't stack up. Um, well, I mean, if you, look, if you look at the economic justification, I'll probably pass to Dan, but if you look at, you know, America has tried not to shut down. And they're, they're, the New York Times had a fantastic cover article. This is the biggest uh, recession that they've ever faced. So they didn't really shut down and their economy is trashed. Sweden didn't shut down, but their economy also. Economies, this is a global society we live in. And if you imagine it, each different country is a cog in the wheel. The fact that your cog is turning, but the other country's cog is not turning, you need to interdigitate. And if you can't interdigitate, your economy will slow down. So I think that it's a specious argument to say economy or life. Uh, economy is dependent on life and life is dependent on economy. So they co-evolve. So it's not one or other. Um, I'm no economist. I, I wouldn't. I'm not like uh, Mr. Jones or the, the other chap. I, I'm not going to commentate on the economy because I don't understand it. Uh, but what I can tell you is, our economy is there to support our life and to facilitate the way we want to live. Uh, to, to just say, don't worry about the people that are going to die, they don't count, that, that's not acceptable. Mm, agreed. Uh, thanks very much, John. And we'll move very shortly to questions from the audience. But I would just like to uh, give a shout out to everyone who's joined us today. I can see we've got 705 participants. So huge interest in this webinar today. And thanks again to all our panellists for giving up their time uh, I'm sure all of you are exhausted uh, by now but we we really do appreciate it and thanks for these questions that are coming in as well we'll get there very shortly but I did um, just want to I guess throw it open to all the panelists um, if you could think of one thing that you've learned because of this information sharing or from the data what sticks out to you as, as things that you wouldn't have access to without um, this kind of information sharing that you're seeing through the consortium? Carol, perhaps I'll start with you. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that, um, you know, we've already learnt, for example, that steroids um, improve survival. So dexamethasone is a great example where we have rapidly deployed research. Now, this was led out of the UK by the recovery um, trialists. Um, this wasn't part of the consortium, but um, essentially this sort of data from large groups of people who've come together across many hospitals is what led to the discovery that steroids would save lives with COVID-19. So I think that we already within the consortium have thousands of patients um, enrolled and we've, we're collecting data on you know, simple intensive care procedures like prone positioning and high flow nasal therapy and other things that we question whether they're the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. Um, so I think that the only way that we can really learn quickly um, particular techniques that are going to work in COVID-19 until we have a vaccine to save lives is by this gathering of data. I think before I go to Dan, um, I, I think the key thing is if people are in, see five or ten patients and they think that's a bit odd, but it, probably not a signal. But once you see 5,000 patients, we realise that's a real signal. And that's the beauty of, you know, 
you know, hashtag stronger together. My one example I'll give before I go to Dan is, uh, uh, and I can speak openly, but this is covered in the Guardian. So Vietnam did incredibly well, uh, but there was a patient who was actually a Scottish patient who ended up on ECMO, which is a very expensive artificial lung technology. And Vietnam hasn't done many of these cases because it's incredibly expensive. And the, the chap developed a clotting disorder, which is really tricky to manage. And there's different drugs you can use on this. And True joined the call. I think Dan and Carol were both on the call. True, the doctor from Vietnam, was doing an amazing job, joined the call and asked me, did I have any thoughts about how we could deal with this? Because this 42-year-old British airline pilot was going to die. And I said, look, I could help a little bit, but Dr. Bartlett, are you on the call? And Dr. Bartlett is the man who invented the artificial heart-lung machine. And wow. uh, Bob Bartlett's on the call and goes, yes, John. <laughs> I said, well, uh, I could answer, but I'm merely a pup. Uh, Dr. Bartlett, can you help True? Of course, True, here's my number. And, uh, and True went off into the distance with the man that invented ECMO before I was born. And that patient has left uh, got off the ECMO machine, got off the ventilator and is back home in Scotland. So that man, you know, to, to, for a, a junior but brilliant doctor in Vietnam to have access to a world, that would never have happened. And those relationships and those crisscrossing, um, it's, it's a small but it's a personal thing. And, and those things are happening all the time in that consortium. Dan? Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the, uh, there's so many investigators in the consortium and that's allowed... Um, uh, many study, many areas to be studied, and there's uh, what I've seen uh, a number of subgroups. Some studying, as John said, the uh, the uh, uh, um, clotting system of the body. Some studies, some groups are studying uh, the uh, effect of COVID on the heart and the lungs, on the neurologic system. And so I think that's what's been of value. And and just to um, highlight this, you know, and, and the data, we get uh, reports from these in our bi-weekly meetings uh, fairly frequently. So we're, we're always up to date, uh, really faster than can be obtained in the, in our medical literature. And a recent uh, study that did come out looking at the effects of COVID that is something that I know Carol is studying is that, you know, just because you may Make it through COVID and you don't die in the intensive care unit and um, you don't get super sick from COVID. We're still worried about the long-term effects. And, and this is what we talk about a lot in, in, the, uh, in the consortium. And there was just a trial that came out uh, from a German group that uh, had patients. It was in our, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association. And they, they looked at 100 patients uh, that had COVID, but were not really that ill from COVID. But even without being ill, they found that um, a high percentage, I think it was almost 80 percent of them had effects of the, their heart by the virus. And so I think that the subgroups that are present in the consortium are really doing incredible work. And because of the volume of patients that they can uh, um, you know, group together, we're, we're going to get some very important information that will help us uh, manage these patients. Thank you. Uh, that brings me, I guess, to our first uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I've got two questions that are quite similar, one from Christina Philp or Philip and one from Ingmar Wolquist, who um, asks uh, along similar lines to what you were just talking about, that there's been uh, increasing information that COVID does affect um, the not only the respiratory system, but the heart, the central nervous system, and things like that as well. Um, Carol, perhaps I'll come to you first. We've got a specific question here on uh, the development of chronic respiratory um, conditions in patients. Uh, is there um, a comment that you'd like to make on, on that and what you found from the data? Yeah, absolutely. So it's early days yet, you can imagine. So, you know, I'm going to talk about international data rather than Australian data because we've got very little Australian data to date. But what we are seeing is that patients who were short of breath um, before, um, as they presented with COVID, sorry, are, are certainly tending to stay short of breath up to 60 days after COVID. So um, another study that was also published in the Journal of the American Medical Association was from about 170 patients in Rome. And they found that, you know, over 50% of these patients had three or more symptoms 60 days after recovering from COVID um, compared to beforehand. So what we don't know is how long 
symptoms will persist. Um, we know that if you had chronic lung disease before that you are likely to be worse. We know that if you were critically ill and that you had lung infiltrates when you're in intensive care, it's likely that they will remain and persist for a period of time. We know from other groups of patients who've had acute respiratory distress and who've survived ICU, not COVID, but other forms of respiratory distress, that, that, can, um, that the, the long-term effects on the lungs can last for many years, um, two to five years. Um, and we just don't know with COVID if that's going to be the case, but it's entirely possible that it will be. Um, and I think it's important to say that this is a small group of people who have some sort of ongoing severe effects. Most people end up with um, some fatigue, um, muscle weakness, uh, cough, shortness of breath, but that would be a part, you know, that would pass fairly quickly and they'll recover. So we are talking about a relatively small cohort who will persist with severe, severe problems. But, you know, there have been um, concerns about brain function, cognitive function, as, as well as we know, you know, from, from other um, coronaviruses like MERS and SARS, we know that up to 30% of patients end up with um, anxiety and depression and about 40% with post-traumatic stress. So it's definitely a concern that, that our survivors will um, live with some sort of ongoing um, disability as they move forward. And, and the question is just, will that recover? So and I agree. I think this talks also to Ebony to your point about the the armchair commentators uh, about it's only old people that die. Uh, being alive is more than just having a pulse. It's having a worthwhile life. So as Dan says, seventy or eighty percent have cardiac dysfunction. There was a study published recently showing healthcare workers that have had a snotty nose. You know the ones that aren't sick. Up to seventy percent of them had markers of brain injury in their blood. Wow. These are people that didn't go into hospital. These are people that watch Netflix at home for a couple of days. So we don't know, like Carol says, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, Carol, we've got relatively small data. Carol's running the study. But globally, we're looking at a two-year study follow-up because, and again, this talks to the Institute, the economic impact is if we have people that have delirium and you know cognitive dysfunction or can't walk as far, can they go back to work? Because the healthcare cost is going to be huge. And the people earning the taxes to pay the healthcare costs is going to go down. So the economic impact of, you know, this will sound like a terrible thing, but uh, death is a lot cheaper than a bad survivor. You know, you have a bad survivor that needs long-term nursing care, long-term ventilation, can't go back to work, has costs associated with unemployment benefit. That's got a huge economic ramification. And again, I'm no economist, uh, but the pot will empty at some point. The bank account will empty at some point. Uh, so the long-term outcomes, and that's why globally we're doing this and Carol's involved in that as well, um, to look and see at two years, can you go back to work? Do you have normal relationships? Do you have delirium? Do you get, do you get nightmares? Survival, sorry, death is not the worst outcome. And this is where people are saying it's just the old people that die. We're talking about healthcare workers, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, and we don't know. So if you've got Dan Mayer in Texas who is looking after an ICU, uh, you get Carol Hodgson down there, and we all don't know. This is the Rumsfelds, you know, the unknown unknowns. You've got a panel of people that are dealing with this on a global aspect. And we admit not knowing. I'm amazed that these commentators know what we don't know. Mm. Well said. Uh, and uh, Richard Dennis, our chief economist, he wasn't able to, to join us today, but uh, he's made similar points about how economists do uh, value life and how the government values life. And you're absolutely right. It's... Um, about more than just uh, death. Um, Dan, did you have anything that you'd like to add to that before we move on to the next question? No, I mean, I agree with uh, what was said. Um, the, um, the next question is from Mark Steele, who asks, what are the most prominent indicators of a bad outcome uh, if you contract COVID-19 other than absolute age? John, if I can come to you first on that one. Sure. Uh, well, some of the things we're seeing is uh, high blood pressure. Oh, oh, diabetes is a major problem. Uh, high blood pressure is a major problem. Uh, age, as you say, is a major blood pressure. Obesity uh, is a significant income. There also seems to be disparate um, uh, racial groups. So in the UK, uh, if you're Afro-Caribbean, I think from memory, uh, has got a major, major outcome and uh, disadvantaged outcome. Uh, at the start, it looked very, very much male versus female. It seems to be less so now. But then at the start, the idea was that young people didn't get infected. Young people do get infected. The WHO released stuff yesterday. 
young people do get infected, they've got a, a better physiological reserve and they tend to get less sick. And sometimes they don't look sick at all and that's problematic because they don't see themselves at risk, they don't feel unwell, they maybe don't socially distance as well as the rest, but they can spread to the other people. I think one of the key interest areas of our consortium is these uh, these groups, whether they're racial groups or socioeconomic groups, and socioeconomically is a, is a marker as well, is really problematic in the low middle income countries. So we have, as I say, you know, Texas, one of the biggest economies in the world on the same phone call as Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's got 14 functional ventilators at the moment for a country of 14 million people. So uh, the, but the data, the, the low middle income countries don't have the, the infrastructure, the research infrastructure, or the data collation ability to look at their own data. So again, we're trying through the consortium to get some money together to collect the data from them because part of your question I can't answer because we don't know what happens. Is it, is it, you know, is it an Afro-African genetic makeup or is it Afro-Americans in America with a low socioeconomic group? Which, which is it? Is it? Um, so that's a, it's a fascinating area, but there are some of the, the key factors. Chronic illness gives you a predisposition as well. Uh, uh, so they're, they're some of the key factors. Thank you. Um, the next question I've got is from, uh, well, they're related, I think, uh, Victoria Tong and Jack Sussmilch. That's a great surname, Jack Sussmilch. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, this one's for you, Dan. Um, he, Victoria asks, is it important to factor in social attitudes when implementing health policy? Your example about Texans not wanting to be told what to do and saying that at the beginning in the US, the hardest hit spots um, would seem to be more progressive and dense, dense northeast cities, uh, while the rest of the country wasn't as hard hit. And would it have been better to delay lockdowns in Texas, Florida that were less hard hit? Um, uh, and, and then Jack's question that I thought was kind of related to that was what factors do the panel attribute to the higher death rate in the United States? Um, so perhaps uh, to start with you, Dan. Um, well, that's a, a tough, interesting question. Um, well, we see, you know, a, like from a social standpoint, there are a lot of um, issues that come up in what I see a lot of the patients being a surgeon uh, we see the patients that have to um, actually go on that machine that John was talking about, the artificial heart lung machine, um, for uh, the management of this of COVID nineteen. And we do see a lot of uh, um, there are a lot of social aspects with that because of their resources available, their resources to manage this mass of patients. So difficult decisions have to be made. Uh, what age, like. Um, there are a lot of older patients get, that do get COVID, but um, are those the patients that can be helped um, with some of these technologies? So these are um, questions that we have to uh, address and decisions have to be made to, to uh, um, you know, able to help the most a number of patients with their resources available. And, you know, like John said, you know, the U.S. has a lot of resources but even there, even in that situation, um, there are many uh, patients we have to turn down and we actually have an ethics committee um, because when we get to our number of patients, like in our unit, say we can only have 12 to 15 patients on these machines because they take so many nurses to run and um, they're in the hospital on these machines, just in the ICU on the machines for three or four weeks. We have an ethics committee involved to help make these decisions because, um, and they're not easy decisions, but all these, all these very difficult issues come up uh, that um, you know, sometimes don't seem fair, but uh, there are decisions that have to be made because yeah. they are. Really then without going into um, specifics, I guess, that's something that we as lay people really um you know, don't even think about, but where health systems do get overwhelmed, you're talking about the ethics committee there and the role of determining, you know, at what point um, you give intervention uh, if with limited resources and how you make those decisions. Um, can you just talk us through a little bit about that and 
what are the kinds of discussions um, that that happen within a hospital in that in that setting? Oh, yes, but as as an aside, I'll I'll add that the consortium, one of the subgroups, and John can elaborate on it. I don't know as much about it, but there is a group from Oxford that is looking at you know the um, not the quality of life, but the value of life, and uh, depending on the patient's age, their work experience and different factors that go into these decisions to place the patient either on a ventilator or on ECMO. And so it's, it's very, uh, you know, complicated and not, you know, it's not always, uh, you know, there's a discussion about the equitable, you know, use of these resources and what really is fair for different people. Mm-hmm. So the answer is we don't know. Add- yeah. The answer is we don't know. So the, the editor, um, uh, Julian uh, Solyescu, who's the editor of the Journal of Medical Ethics, is, you know, the, the question is, if you've got two patients and one ventilator, who do you treat? Because, again, walking our shoes, we haven't had to do this in Brisbane, we've had very little, but you, we've heard from people in all the different places, you've got two 30-year-old mums, who gets the ventilator? And this is where it's so galling to hear people telling us in newspapers what we should be doing. Uh, we, 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 we just don't know. So what we're doing is doing a survey of, of the global community and saying, how would you judge? You've got a limited resource and it's distributive justice. How do you judge that? Um, watch this space. I don't think there's a right answer. Um, mm. It is interesting, though, the low middle income countries are way ahead of us in this. They say we, we do this every day. Uh, you yeah. know, we have to do this every day. In Texas and Melbourne and, and you know places, we we've got a luxury that we've not had to deal with this, uh, but we need to know how to use those resources more appropriately, when to come off them, when not to use them, and that's the power of global data. Um, I was going to ask just a follow up on that, and is that cultural to a certain extent too? So, for example, uh, in some Western countries where older people come to the uh, end of their lives, you have, like we've talked about, some commentators kind of dismissing that as, oh, well, they're, you know, they're only going to live for a few more years anyway, whereas you've got other cultures that place a really high value on um, older people within the society. So uh, is there any comment, I guess, that you can you can make on that? I'll tell you, if you I'll, I'll let the, the other guy, I, I think you're right, there is um, the, the way that we treat patients, that medicine is not all science, there's an awful lot of art, and the way you perform medicine is dependent on roughly the way your mum taught you to behave, uh, but the, the ethos that got you into medicine, as well as the cultural aspect, so we're seeing really, really interesting data, uh, we put some questions out, is it, okay, so you've got one mum here, she's got three kids, and you know, she helps at a local uh, tuck shop or she's the CEO of the local accountancy building. And this mum over here has a criminal record. Uh, would you determine who gets the ventilator? Would the criminal record that that mum's got, would that predispose to you ventilating or not ventilating? And you do see, and I'm not going to tell you which countries, uh, but you do see some places saying, well, if they've got a criminal record, they're less worthy of the ventilator huge yeah. huge questions and a big big variety of uh, results but again there is no right answer on this i'm not criticizing saying that because someone has to make that decision mm. uh, and it won't be andrew bolt yeah uh but it is it does make you think too about you know over incarceration of certain ethnic yeah. minorities and other things yeah. as well yeah a lot comes into play there um carol this next question is for you from nikki morabito uh as a physiotherapist, uh, they would love to hear more about your research study as well as some of the interventions that you've found effective in early rehab of COVID patients in Melbourne. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Nikki. Um, so we've actually got a great collaboration of physios across Australia collecting data on the interventions that we're providing to the COVID-19 patients. Um, again, this study has only just started because it took a while to get ethical approval across all five states. Um, but we've got 40 hospitals now. And so, you know, hopefully in a few months when we've got all of the data in for the COVID-19 patients to date, I'll be able to tell you exactly what is being effective. Um, at this point, we don't know. Um, we also 
also don't know, you know, there are some hospitals where the physios have been discouraged from entering the bed area in COVID um, positive patients. So, you know, very much telemedicine. If you can um, ring through to the nurse at the bedside and offer some advice and you're not required to be in the bed area, we're saving PPE and you're putting less staff at risk. So whether that is a great model of care or not a great model of care, we don't know either. But um, it's certainly um, helping to keep our staff safe, which is being important, particularly at the beginning when we didn't know whether the health system would be overwhelmed and we were worried about losing staff members and how many staff members we'd, we'd require. With regards to the question about rehab, that's, that's a great question. Rehab's been really difficult with COVID-19 for many reasons, um, partly because of the not wanting to put many staff into the bed area. Um, you know, again, to get a patient, a critically ill patient up and out of bed takes, you know, sometimes four people. And if you want to be really safe with a COVID patient, maybe five or six. Um, it's hard to get that many people together. It's hard to have the equipment available. So we don't want to take in a lot of our normal ICU equipment. It's very difficult to wipe it down and keep it clean. So if it goes into the COVID pod, we can't then move it back out of the COVID pod. It just has to stay there. So that means that, you know, our normal group of patients, our non-COVID group of patients um, don't have access to that piece of equipment. So wherever possible, we've really tried to um, separate out equipment so that we've got equipment available for both COVID and non-COVID. We've got staff available for both COVID and non-COVID. We've worked in teams as much as possible to deliver the rehab and we're really missing the families in the intensive care unit. Um, you know, it's not just the patients that are heartbroken over this, it's, it's the clinicians. We would usually use it, um, the families as um, a source of encouragement, a source of motivation, um, somebody to record the progress of their loved one. Um, and we're, we're all missing having the input of the family in, in the unit to try and um, promote early rehabilitation. Um, but the clinicians are doing a fantastic job. Everybody's working together as a great team. Um, we're certainly doing the best we can with, um, you know, at times what feels like a little bit of limited resources just because we can't have things in both COVID and non-COVID areas. So it's not that we don't have the resources, we just don't have enough to split across both areas. But, um, you know, on the whole, uh, all I can say is that the, the healthcare workers, particularly the team that I work with, are working harder than they ever have before and they're doing an amazing job. Thanks, Carol. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. John, I might come to you for a final word. In less than a minute, uh, what's a few thoughts that you'd like to leave us with here today or a message to everyone who's watching? Uh, look, I think, you know, uh, this is a bad time. It's a bad time for everyone. It's a bad time for, for physicians, politicians. I think we've done very well in Australia. I think we can see when politics goes awry and it, and it dictates. I think that's problematic. I think what I've seen, you know, in a terrible time, in a time of isolation and quarantine, we've actually created a global family. I've learned so much from people like Dan and, uh, and other people I've never met before. I think the power of coming together is it. I think we have a responsibility in Australia. We're in an incredibly fortunate position to be able to lead and facilitate this consortium for the rest of the world that is getting absolutely smashed. I think there's a moral responsibility to look after the the poorer, less well-off countries, we can't give them all the gizmos we have, but they can get access to that data. And data is power. And we need to use it uh, well, effectively, uh, and you know, create something better that can come out of the ashes that's uh, 2020. Mm, well said. Uh, we will have to wrap it up there. I want to extend a, a really heartfelt thanks to the three of you, Professor John Fraser, Professor, Professor Carol Hod Hodgson, and to you, Dr. Dan Meyer, all the way from Texas, where it's extremely late at night. I know you all must be uh, exhausted uh, from battling this virus. And we really appreciate all the time you've given to us today. Uh, and John Fraser, I'm not sure if that's a Glaswegian accent, but between you and Norman Swan, I'm now associating that, uh, <laughs> that accent with um, comfort and calm authority. So we, we very much appreciate your, your time today. Um, and thank you to Christine Jackman and everyone at the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium who've assisted with putting this webinar together today. And thank you everyone who has come along to ask all of your great questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to them all, but we do appreciate you participating. This has been a special episode of Follow the Money, and we're aiming to bring you shorter but more frequent episodes during the pandemic, so please stay tuned. 
you can check out our website at tai.org.au forward slash webinars to register for our upcoming webinars. For the latest health information, you can check health.gov.au or listen to the ABC's excellent CoronaCast podcast, which comes out daily. You can visit tai.org.au for all our latest research and content, and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Professor Carol Hodgson is at C Hodgson, that's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-A-N-Z-I-C-R-C. The COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium is at COVID Critical. And this episode was produced by Jennifer Macy with help from Holly Forrest, Grace Crivellero and Lucy Law. And remember, stay one and a half metres away, keep washing those hands, wear a mask and thanks for listening. Thank you.